are around the world. Welcome to Unheard Stories. I am Lubna Hassania, and I come to you from spectacular Southern California. My guest today is George Shamshum, Emmy and multiple award-winning film director and producer and executive director of the Asian World Film Festival. I would like to start by welcoming the dignitaries on the call, His Excellency Gabriel Aissa, former ambassador of Lebanon to the United States, His Excellency Jean Macaron, former ambassador of Lebanon to Kuwait, Councillor Mirna Khawli, former Consul General of Lebanon to LA, and Councillor Ghassan Abdel Khaliq, former Chargé d'Affaires of Lebanon to India. We also have with us the Honorable Judge Tony Raphael. Welcome to everyone and thank you for joining the conversation. George Shanshum is a citizen of the world. He was born in Niger, West Africa. His father, who was born in Brazil to a Lebanese immigrant family, had moved to Africa to start a business. As to George's mother, she was born in Niger, also to a Lebanese family. When George turned four, the Shamshums moved to Lebanon so the kids can go to school there. Now, between their summer house in beautiful Miziara in the Zgarta district and their winter house in Tripoli, George lived some of the best years of his life. By the age of eight, his father had located, quote, the best school in the world for George to attend. In 1954, George was admitted to Ecole des Roches in Normandy, France, where he would spend the next several years. He graduated in 1968 from Le Conservatoire du Cinéma Français. George lived, studied, and worked in many other countries, including Germany, England, Wales, Poland, Greece, Benin, Nigeria, China, Canada, and the US. With his mind set on the world, George never hesitated to explore cultures and traditions using his camera and his profession as filmmaker. He has directed and produced over 35 feature films throughout Africa, the Middle East, Europe, and the United States. George served as the international director or relations executive of several film festivals from Yakusha to Lebanon, from Korea to Canada, and from Paris to Monaco. He served as a board member of the Francophone Film Festival and the Pan Pacific Film Festival and co-founded Film Festival Synergy, a union of worldwide film festivals. He's currently the executive and program director of the Asian World Film Festival, which connects talent from over 50 Asian countries with opportunity through cross-cultural collaboration. In December 2018, the, Southern, the South Korean Ministry of Culture and Sports bestowed upon him the coveted Dari Award for bridging and promoting the Korean culture in the United States. George was honored by the UNESCO for his body of work and dedication to Lebanese cinema. And most recently, he was named one of the 100 most influential Lebanese in the world. Hello, George. Hi, hello. How are you today? I'm good. I see many uh, faces, people I haven't seen in a long time and people that I see every day. And, yes. and we have also with us Lisa Lu. She's under Lisa Wong. She is an icon in the Asian and Asian American okay. cinema. Now, George, you once wrote, and I quote you, I just got tested and I tested positive for the optimist virus. What inspires your optimism and why is it so important to remain optimistic despite all the uncertainties surrounding us? Well, my optimism came since I was a kid because I was always surrounded by a fantastic family. Uh, let it be my brothers or sisters or my brothers-in-law. They will always be, let me make it clear. They were never very encouraging for the movies, but they were very encouraging as a person. They always, they were always there for me. They were always backing me and, uh, 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 so my optimism really comes from this because I never felt that I was abandoned or alone. So I always say, you know what? Tomorrow is another day. If anything happens, there'll always be an angel. And those angels were mostly my family. And now those angels are people like Lisa Lu, who's here, Andy Chang, uh, my, my good friends that never, never leaves me and are always supporting me. 
Yes, it's good to know. You know, optimism is actually a mindset. You have it in your mind to remain optimistic and a trust that things will work out at the end of the day, right? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Well, George, your journey with the movies goes back to when you were real young. Can you take us back on a trip to the well, open theater yeah. <laughs> in Niger? I, yeah, in June, in June, actually, it will be exactly 57 years when I did my first movie, Inside oh. Out, 57 yeah. years ago, June. Yeah. And um, I... You know, uh, th this is a question that a lot of people ask me all the time. Why the movies? I mean, when every single person in my family are all business people, you know, I mean, literally brothers and uh, parents, et cetera, et cetera, even my mother. Um, uh, you know, we lived in a village in Niger, in Niger uh, literally in the Sahara Desert. Okay. And um, the village was called Magaria. And the nearest uh, place where it was a little town was then there. It was about an hour and a half by car. Uh, so we were the only white people beside the the uh, uh, beside the uh, the commandant circle. I don't know le, le cercle du command le commandant du cercle, which is he represents the French government. He was the only white and us, and. Uh, you know, at night there's absolutely nothing. You know, beside you know the, uh, you know you go uh, from one house to another. But in Magaria, we didn't go to any house. It was only this the commandant circle or our house. Mm -hmm. And my father uh, built a cinema um, for the villages. Uh, he built them a cinema, and it's only at night because it's an open air cinema, like in most in those days in Africa, and it was free. For, for the people. So they would go and watch movies. So when I was born, uh, my mother, I wasn't going to sit at home alone. You know, I mean, what? there's no nothing, uh, no TV, nothing. So she would go to the theater, to the cinema every day uh, to see, you know, we used to see those American serials or Charlie Chaplin and uh, uh, and Luke Costello, Lauren Hardy, et cetera, et cetera. And then she told me that uh, she would hold me. I was like maybe what a month, two months. She would hold me in her arms, and instead of being on her breast, you know, either eating or whatever, uh, I my head would turn all the time towards the the, the screen. And she said, "You were totally riveted. You were not interested in anything else." So yes. maybe uh, unconsciously, you know, I was fed since I was, you know, few months. So I was fed you know, uh, from the silver screen and yes. and the rest is history. I I mean, of course, my father always dreamt for me to be a banker or whatever, actually a banker. And, uh, and God dressed his soul and he was such a wonderful man. I mean, you know, uh, he never stopped me. He never stopped me on, on I, I, he never stopped me telling me, no, 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 you cannot do this. He would let me do it. And I would pay, if I made a mistake, I would pay myself. So I learned everything myself. And I'm still learning, you know. And so um, I did two years uh, of economy, but I was so bored. I, I just couldn't take it. And uh, I went to film school. And uh, uh, I, uh, I told my father, he never said anything. My mother didn't say anything. Um, uh, and, you know, I, I, I just wasn't interested in any, even when I was in school, uh, my only goal was movies. I knew I wanted to make movies. I would study, the, uh, uh, you know, just to go to the next year. You know, I wasn't interested in anything but the cinema. Of course, in school, I was very much interested in languages and geography and history, mm -hmm. but the rest didn't interest me. So uh, 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 they, my father went, you know, uh, he took his family to Lebanon, Tripoli, like all the fathers in those days, you know, uh, the mother would stay uh, with the kids so the kids can go to school and my father would come for the holidays to visit us. But we 
it was we I lived uh, a very interesting uh, youth. We were 18 kids in one apartment, 18 kids. Wow. And these kids are my cousins, first cousin, you know, my father's sisters, mm -hmm. uh, the, all the kids. So we ranged from the youngest was my sister, Rosie. She was uh, four or five and, and the eldest was about 20 years old. So we ranged all and they all loved movies. I mean, literally, I mean, on Saturday, Sunday, we would all flock to the movies. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Th th those years that we lived in this house, uh, this apartment in Tripoli, was the best years of my life, definitely. And and I hope one day, if God gives me more time, I would like to make a movie about that. So but from there, my father said, you know what, I'm going to put him in the best school. I'm going to try and put him in yes. some school in Europe. So he was what thinking school? about either what England. School? What school did you attend in Lebanon? Was uh, it uh, Collège des Frères. Okay. Okay. Collège des Frères de la Salle in Tripoli. Mm -hmm. uh, like uh, I see uh, one of them here, Michel Jazar was there with okay. me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, uh, so my father, so my father said, I'm going to put this kid in the best school. So what he did, not <laughs> thinking twice about the 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 repercussion, the emotional repercussion that being alone. So they chose friends. So I was at this Ecole des Roches, which is one of those you know, uh, very prestigious schools. We were about 300 kids. And uh, it was very tough being far away from my mother. Uh, I I longed for, for the mother's love all my life. Mm. Uh, maybe that's why I always, I'm surrounded by women all the time. Mm. To this day, age 76. But uh, it was, you know, they didn't think about this. They only thought that, okay, we put him in the best school. That's the best thing that could happen to him. You know, yes, but, you know you have... they were doing the best thing for you. That's absolutely true. Yeah. Like you said but... nothing can replace the nurturing and loving touch of a mother, right? And her presence. Yeah, around. absolutely. But... How did you deal with it? Uh, sorry? How did you deal with that separation at the time? It was tough. It was very... actually, you know, you have friends. You're surrounded by friends. We lived in, in, in mansions, like 30 kids per mention and uh, uh, half of the kids, their parents were all over the world also, same thing, they were in the same position. But the other half, their parents were in France. So what happens is we would go out during the weekend. Mm -hmm. and, and the first weekend, I remember the, the we had a father and a mother. So they, they, they you know, we, we, we met mm -hmm. and they said, guys, you know, a lot of your friends, they don't have parents. So please take them during the weekend with you, take them for lunch or, uh, you know, whatever, just take them. So there was a, uh, my friend, he wasn't my friend because this was the first week, uh -huh. but I would speak so much about movies. Uh -huh. the, 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 the kid who was uh, sharing my, my, uh, my desk, Benjamin Goodrich. Okay. Uh, he was crazy about planes and he would play with planes during the class and the, the teacher would go crazy. So I said, Goodrich, 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 you know, uh, it's either the tires. But I was a kid. I didn't know. But he said, I'm sure he had something to do with, with, with planes. So the first weekend, which was the second weekend, actually, he said, I'm taking you with me this weekend. I said, OK, thank you. So what happened is uh, when we were waiting outside that famous Saturday, that famous first Saturday, second Saturday, you know, the first I this I will never remember. I will never forget. The first car that arrived was a Rolls Royce, black Rolls Royce. And this incredible woman comes out, uh, you know, very thin, beautifully dressed with the hat. I'm telling you, like, like a, a, a flying saucer, a huge hat uh -huh. uh, with the red rose on it. She comes out and behind me, uh, Jean, um, uh, uh, Jean, uh, uh, Jean Louis Richie. Uh, Ritchie, oh, okay. Ritchie. Okay. he said uh -huh. oh that, that's my mom so it was Nina Ritchie who comes out of the car and she comes to us she says hello she greets us then the next you know few seconds other cars Michel Morgan comes out Michel Morgan was like one of the biggest stars in those days Jaja Gabor uh, uh, her godson was in my the dorm and he was already my friend after uh -huh. two weeks and then this old Citroën from the 40s taxi comes in 
<laughs> and stops. And 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 when I saw the lady coming out, I thought I was going to have a heart attack. I said, oh my God. I looked at Benjamin. I said, this is Olivia de Havilland. He said, yeah, so? I said, okay. <laughs> I didn't say anything. He must be crazy if he doesn't know Olivia. He said, so what? It's not a big deal. So she comes towards us. And then the first thing what happened, Olivia says, hi, Benjamin. And he said, hi, mom. When he said, hi, mom, I said, oh my God, she's taking me out for the weekend. And the rest again is history because she took care of me for the eight years when I was at that school. And I still saw her until about 10 years before she passed away last year at age 104. Yes, yes. I mean, for those who do not know who Olivia de Havilland is, she, she's, she played the role of Melanie. Melanie, in correct. And God win the wind. Gone yeah. with the wind. Yes, yes. Iconic, iconic figure. That's a nice experience. What a nice experience you had to live. I know, especially, so you know, wanting to be in the movies and, uh, you yes. know, uh, yeah, it was interesting. All that added to your love of movies, definitely. Yes. Now, yes, yes. After years of schooling in Normandy, you started touring Europe, right? You went to Germany, Wales, Poland, Russia. Yeah, well, as I said, my father never stopped me. So instead of yes. having the baccalaureate in France, I told uh -huh. my father I'm going to go to Germany because <laughs> my first language was German. So I said, you know, to learn the language, let's go to Germany. So I did my abitur in Germany, which is the baccalaureate. From there, uh, I went to Wales. There was this new, there was a, a, a man by the name, he's a legend actually in education. His name is Dr. Kurt Hahn. And he started a new school uh, called Atlantic College. Uh, now it's called United World College. So Atlantic College, he created it and he said, I'm going to do that school and have about 100, 150 kids in this school, but not more than three per country. So we were kids from all over the world. So he thought by doing this, maybe there'll be, there'll be peace in the world. Well, guess what? Even though we're, we, we're very powerful alumni, and uh, we have people all over the world now. They, we, there are, think about 14 or 15 United World College in the world now. Mm -hmm. uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, uh, India, uh, in America, they have three. Uh, and anyway, so I was, I was uh, that school was created in 63. I went there in 1964. Yeah. yeah, excellent concept, excellent concept. But you came back to France also to... Yeah, to finish, to I finished my finish. French schooling yes. Yes, at the Conservatoire du Cinema, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. yes, What did each country at the time mean to you, George? And which one felt more like home, if any? I felt home in every place I went, honestly. Uh, I, I, I love traveling, I love languages, I love people. My biggest hobby in France, because I lived in France no more, I lived in France some 22 years. So when I used to take the metro, uh, for me uh, was to listen to the people around me and guess which country they were, even sometime from which region they were when they spoke their language. So that was my biggest, biggest, uh, I, I loved that. I loved listening to people talking from their own language. I'm, to, to, to this day, I cannot, when I see two people talking uh, a, a foreign language and I don't understand, I go next to them to make sh to, 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 to be able to hear the, their voices and guess from where they come. How so, many languages do you speak, George? Well, actually, th there was a one, one point I spoke nine, nine languages. Now I can say I, can, I speak fluent about six, five, six languages maybe, but some of them like German, for example, I need to go back to Germany for two, three days to get it back, but I can read and write. Yes, yeah. that's how it is usually, yes, when you leave it for a while. Yeah. Um, George, you also had an opportunity to train under Andrei Tarkovsky and Roman Polanski. They are considered to be two of the greatest and most influential directors and producers. What did you learn from these two iconic figures in well, film? They're two completely different, uh, pole opposite in, in mentality and, and character. Uh, Polanski was an amazing guy. I mean, on the set, it was exciting. It was, it was like a whirlwind. And but the thing is, I used to bother him so much because I couldn't explain myself why I had this 
attraction to Poland. I everything that has to do with Polish. I read every book about Poland. I read uh, actually there was a, a, a book called Mila 18, uh, which I read like four or five times. Uh, it, 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 I was like crazy about Poland. So when I was with him, I would I would go to him and ask him questions. He said, you know, can you get the hell out of here, please? I'm trying to make a movie. And we'll talk later about Poland. And one day he surprised me and he said, here, uh, uh, I'm sending you to Poland and uh, you can, you can, you can, you know, uh, have whatever you want. So I went to Poland and I stayed about five months, six months. And I went to first to Warsaw, then Sopot up north, and then uh, to Łódź, where the film school is. Um, of course, uh, uh, I was mostly with film people the whole time, okay? And uh, I learned a lot. I learned a lot. And with Polanski, it was on repulsion, on the set of repulsion. Tarkovsky is another story. It was in uh, 1970. He was shooting a movie called Solaris. Hmm. And um, I just bluntly asked, I would like to be on the set if it's possible. And they didn't refuse. He said, yeah, okay. But uh, uh, um, as much as Polanski used to be a whirlwind, uh, Tarkovsky was extremely mellow, calm. Uh, he would take a, a full day to shoot one shot, one shot. He would take a full day. So I was dead. I mean, I was bored to death. But having this man, I mean, and this the charisma he had, of course, we couldn't speak on the set. But after, uh, we would go and listen to jazz music, uh, because in those days in Moscow, it wasn't allowed. But uh, uh, Andrei Mikhalkov at his house, we would go to his house and listen to jazz music. And uh, Tarkovsky, of course, would go. Then the discussion would turn so deep and so interesting. And 75% uh, uh, of the time, I didn't understand anything because he was far from mm. anybody else, this guy. I mean, he was incredible. Yes. What did they teach me? Well, you know, uh, just being around them was, was a lesson. Mm. That's, that's good. I'm happy for you. Uh, what, George, what makes a film a good film, in your opinion? What makes a film one to remember? One to remember is something, but uh, what good makes it another. good is another thing. <laughs> okay. uh, uh, I prefer to say what makes a good movie. What makes a good movie is a director who understands how to tell a story from A to Z. Okay, you know, like I, I, I'm I'm a big lover of the the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. Uh, today, the movies, I mean, it's all special effects, etc. cetera. It, it, I don't relate to that. I, I, I want a good story. I want a movie to entertain me, but at the same time to make me discover another world. For example, uh, I'm always having discussion with a lot of people. They say, you travel a lot, so you must have seen so many museums and you've been... No, I don't. I don't because I don't need to go to those places because I see them in the movies. For me, it's like I am there, okay? And I'm not a museum person. I am a people's person. Wherever country I go, I meet people. I like to meet the people. And I go to some CD, CD place. Sometimes my friend, they said, you're not coming back. Uh, you know, just <laughs> whatever. <laughs> but please let us know where you are because I... This is where you meet the real people. I meet them. I sit with them. Uh, luckily, sometimes they invite me to share a meal. I, I love that. This is for me. Uh, uh, it, en it enriches me. So to go back to the movies again, you know, for me, the movies is, it's magic. Okay. It, it takes you out of the world where you are and it, pr it, it, it projects you to another world. Okay. And, 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 and for me, it's the ultimate joy, you know? So uh, uh, what, I ex what, I hope from, uh, what I hope from filmmakers is to tell, tell us stories, tell us interesting stories. There are so many amazing stories in this world that we don't see. This is the problem here in America. Hollywood, they're, they're a scared bunch of people, you know? 
when they see a movie that makes money, they immediately think about, about a uh, either a remake or a sequel or whatever. Why? I mean, there are so many incredible original stories. Take them. Do those stories. Let people see what's out there, you know. Yes. But unfortunately, it's still not the way it should be. Yes, because the focus is on money making, really, not on developing. Yeah. I mean, I understand they want to make money. That's fine with me. I have nothing against. Uh, I mean, I wish they could teach me how to make money. But uh, no, me, I'm more into original uh, content. Yes. And immersive experiences with the movies. This is what yeah. you're looking for. Now, George, as a film director, you are responsible for uh, the film's creative as well as technical aspects. And you're the one to do the casting and the editing. Now, you once said, and I'm quote you, I want to quote you. You said, I am a creative tool to help open people's eyes and educate and entertain them without throwing them artificial gratuities. What did you mean by that? I don't even remember when I said that, but I'm sure I said it. Uh, I, you know, the thing is, you said I, I, I do everything on a movie, okay? Like directing it and then casting it. No, no. I am a kind of person who believes in collaboration. All my life has been about collaboration because I don't know everything, okay? And to be honest with you, uh, uh, when I shoot a movie, I make sure to always have two or three young assistants, you know, they're either fresh from college because they bring so much to a movie. You know, they, they, I, I am not ashamed to say that sometimes I take their ideas because their ideas serve my movie. Okay, so personally, a movie should be a collaborative work. Okay, uh, I have here a couple of my people that work with me uh, that I trust completely and blindly. Actually, one of them, uh, she is going to be my first AD on my next movie, uh, Mary. So, uh, because I trust her and I know she is very, very talented and I know she will bring a lot on the table. So it's not my movie, it's our movie. I've always believed in collaboration and everything, even with festival. Festival, I always believe that we should collaborate. We should, you know, uh, work hand in hand because it is the only way to go to the next step. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, ego goes into the middle sometime with some of the people because they love to, you know, take all the, the, the credit and all the glory. I, I Honestly, I, I don't care. For me, the glory is to succeed with my team. Mm -hmm. That is my glory. Yes. And you always give room uh, for creativity, right? That comes. Uh, with lots. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Good for you, George. And then when you graduated. You, in 1968, you returned to Lebanon and stayed there for a few years, actually. What yes. is it that pulled you back to that old country? Lebanon, how can you not? Yes. I mean, you know, for people <laughs> who don't know Lebanon, believe me, even with, the, with, the, with, the, with all the crap, I'm sorry, that's going on in Lebanon now, it's still one of the greatest country in the world, okay? I mean... Uh, it has everything. Mm -hmm. The people are nice. The food is good. Uh, the ambiance is beautiful. You have the sea. You have the mountains. Uh, you have the weather. You have, I mean, you literally have everything. Uh, the only thing is uh, the leaders that we have, of course, they're so corrupt. And I'm not saying that they're the most corrupt. I, I haven't seen a, a leader who is not corrupt. Uh, but, but the problem is... Uh, the people uh, in Lebanon, what I, I regret is they let themselves go. They don't, they, they're not fighters. Uh, they, 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 all they want is to have fun, uh, to enjoy their life, which I'm fine with that. But guys, well, open your eyes, look what's happening. You need to move, you need to do something. Yes. You know, be, uh, yeah, be, uh, uh, um, how do you say, uh, be okay. Uh -huh. so Enga engaged be engaged on, active yeah. yeah you know yeah, yeah uh, 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 but but we it's, it's very difficult but again 
So I went back to Lebanon because it's my country and I and I and I never felt I mean I love Africa by the way, don't misunderstand me. I feel Niger in my in my body completely, you know, uh, my my blood, my soul, everything about Africa, West Africa. But Lebanon is different. There's something about Lebanon that you cannot define. You have to be there to understand what mm -hmm. Lebanon is. Oh. You know, it, it's just incredible. Yes. And, um, so yeah, I went in 1968 and I immediately started shooting a movie um, Inside Out, which is, of course, I did it in black and white. In those days, you know, movie in black and white was doomed already. Uh, no dialogue, uh, just music. And it's about the effect. It wasn't really about the effect of drugs. A lot of people thought it was about drugs, but in fact, it's your imagine. You can imagine, you don't need drug to, to fly. I fly without drugs, trust me, uh, 24 hours, okay? I mean, I don't need to take a joint or shoot, I, which I never did in my life. And I'm not ashamed to say, if, if I did it, I would say I did it, but I never did it because I'm not interested. Yes. Because I, again, I am high without drugs, okay? I am high by the beauty of the surrounding. I'm high by the beauty of women. That's what uh, takes me to the... To, to that level, or, you know, yeah. I mean, and when I say hi, I am hi, really. So I did a movie about that and I let the people decide, but then again, I was arrested and <laughs> was put under house, house arrest because immediately uh, the censor said, oh, I'm shooting a movie about drugs. It's okay, fine. I mean, it was my first experience. Um, even if it were about drugs, I mean, you know, the more we encourage the conversation, the less the stigma, right, gets internalized. Mm -hmm. I mean, that conversation should be encouraged, right? And people at, the, at that point start seeking treatment. Yeah, well, that was that was also, don't forget, uh, uh, don't forget it was 1968. Yeah. You know, I mean, heaven yeah. on 1968. I mean, I was, that was really, I mean, very controversial what I did. Yes. But, I, you know, I, I just felt like I want to do it. Maybe I... You know, I've always been this kind of person. I like to harkish, how do you say? It? <laughs> poke, poke at things. <laughs> I like to poke at things, yeah, exactly. Um, so, the movie was but, banned, wasn't it? Huh? The movie was banned. It was never released. Yeah, it was never, yes. But then it did all this, the, this, the uh, how do you call it, the university okay. circuit. Okay. It did okay. a couple of festivals and universities. Uh, sorry, you know, no mu no dialogue and music. And the funny thing is, like the circle is closed. I just produced a movie this year uh, called uh, Creation. Okay. Uh, and uh, Sir Daniel Wynn, who's a, uh, an amazing artist, he's a painter, um, sculptor, friend of mine. Uh, wanted to make a movie called Creation. And then uh, he did it with no dialogue and music. And I was saying, I was telling him, imagine who was there. I said, Daniel, how are we going to sell this movie? Ah, don't worry, let's just do it. And I forgot that in 1968, I did the same thing as he did now. So again, as I say, this, the, the, it's a full circle, you know, and... Um, and not only that, Daniel wants to do a feature out of it. Imagine a feature. My, uh, uh, um, Inside Out was 49 minutes. Okay. Now he wants to do it 90 minutes out of uh, creation, which we did in 18 minutes. Yeah. Uh, movie. Yeah. So yeah. It, it's very funny because you, 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 your head functions differently sometimes. But then when I went back and I remembered what I did, yeah, why not? You know, it's interesting and uh, yeah. yeah. And you're not one to be intimidated, George, right? Without wasting any time, you picked up your next project in Lebanon and it was your first feature film called yeah. Salam After Death. Salam, Salam Bad al Mot, yes. Salam but after that death. also was controversial, wasn't it? It was controversial in a couple of days. First of all, I did it also black and white. Yes. Um, uh, my main actress, Habiba, uh, dumped me uh, after the first week because she said, oh, I have to go to Egypt. She went to Egypt and uh, didn't come back after the weekend. I waited and waited and I waited. I wasted a, about a week. Then I had to replace her because she wouldn't answer me. 
um, um, so I replaced her by, by an Egyptian actor. She was a, a huge star. She was like Shirley MacLaine or whatever mm -hmm. uh, of Egypt, Sa Samira Ahmed. Yes. But I wanted to, to make the movie in Lebanese. So the thing is, in those days, you do not make movies in Lebanese. Every Lebanese movie was in Egyptian because nobody would buy or watch a movie if it was Lebanese speaking. It has to be an Egyptian. And in those days, there were only uh, uh, one movie. Uh, Gary Garabedian did a movie which was in Lebanese, and I was the second one. And uh, I wanted to do it in Lebanese. So when uh, the uh, producer approached me, a friend of mine, he said, why don't you use Samir Ahmed? I said, yes, why not? I mean, Jesus Christ, she's a huge star. Let's use her. But I want her to speak in Lebanese. And she agreed. <laughs> She agreed, so she spoke Lebanese, okay? So, black and white, speaking Lebanese, uh, uh, heavy drama. So what happened is, when I took the movie, when it finished, when I took it to, to the distributors, they all told me, no exception, go and dub the film in Egyptian. And I told them, literally, and this is Lebanese say, ruhu baltul bahar, it means, Go marvel the sea. I would no. I would never do that. Maybe it was a mistake to tell them that, and I should have done it in Egyptian so I can get my money back. <laughs> Let maybe it was arrogance. I don't know. I, I don't think it was arrogance because I really thought it was an insult to ask a Lebanese movie to be in Egyptian. Why? I mean, why? We need to start in those days to make movies in Lebanese. So of course uh, the movie did many festivals. I won several awards, but never released in theaters until UNESCO did, uh, when they did a tribute about my movies, uh, they screened the movie. That was the first time it was screened in Lebanon. Yes, in 1982. Something like that, yeah, I, I don't remember, yeah. Well, George, how, how, how painful was the rejection? I mean, you came back to Lebanon, you were a neophyte at the movie industry and you saw nothing so far but rejection. <laughs> Rejection is always uh, painful, no doubt, okay? It doesn't matter how you put it in the equation, it always, uh, uh, it's always uh, painful, okay? Uh, how did I deal with it? I, I honestly, again, maybe because my family were behind me, I had a lot of support from my family, a lot of support from my friends, my friends that I actually, when I go to Lebanon, this is the first thing I do is uh, actually I go to Lebanon mostly to see them, friends that were in, in school with me. So imagine I've known them for 70 years. They're all, you know, crazy about movies. And all we do is talk about movies from Emil Shaheen, who is well known, you know, Emil Shaheen in Lebanon and Edgar Najjar, Mohammed Rida. We would meet and spend nights on end speaking only, talking only about movies. Mm -hmm. That's what I miss the most here. I don't have people that I can sit and talk about movies, and uh, it it it's it's very uh, it is painful for me. But you know, uh, I didn't have a lot of choices. That's why when I go to Lebanon once or twice a year, that's what I do. I yeah. immerse myself totally with my friends, and we talk only about movies. That's all we do. Yes. Well, George, then the war broke out when you were in Lebanon, and from 1975 to 1979, you were shooting a feature documentary to capture some of the unfortunate events of the war <laughs> on camera. You called it Lebanon Why. Yeah. Um, how was uh, that experience? Okay, uh, uh, April 13, 1975, the, the war broke out. Yeah. I remember uh, I had a camera in those days. I had my 16 millimeter. I picked it up and went and filmed where the bus, you know, the massacre of the bus in, uh, where was it, the uh, area I forgot? Um, anyway, in Beirut, in one of the areas in Beirut. And I started filming, and from there, I started mounting a team of six people. And I said, okay, I'm going to do a feature about this war, but I am not going to shoot, for example, only with the Christians or only with the Muslim or only with the Palestinian. I want to shoot with everybody or else I'm not making the movie. Mm -hmm. So what happened is this movie took me four years to make. And it took me four years for the reason is because 
you know, Beirut was cut in two. There was uh, East and West Beirut. So uh, I would go and film with the Christian uh, in the Christian area. Then uh, two weeks, three weeks. Then I would go to Cyprus with my team. We would rest there for a week. Then come back again to East Beirut and then, you know, film. So I wanted to cover everything. The whole, every region, Lebanon, every uh, religion, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, all, uh, I wanted to have the uh, the point of view of each one. Okay. When the movie finished, of course, I was literally lynched by my family because they said, "Oh, you're you're sold to the Palestinian, you're sold to the Muslim." And then I was lynched by the Muslim because they said I was sold to the Christians, to the Phalanges. I was lynched by the Palestinian. They said I'm sold to the Israeli. I, I mean, you have no idea. Everybody uh, um, condemned me. I mean, massacre. It was a massacre. Yes. But I didn't care really. Uh, honestly, I kept on going. And the movie made, I went to 17 festivals. And each festival, we had a lot of uh, controversy during the movie. For example, in Montreal, uh, after what I think it was about 12 minutes, uh, people started fighting inside the, the theater because when Shamoun was on, you know, all the Shamoun people started, you know, and when Jumblat was on, you know, so left and right, they started fighting and they closed the cinema. And there were 17 police cars that surrounded the theater and they shut down the movie. It was at the Montreal Film Festival. Uh, Tehran, same thing. Uh, we had the same problem in the theater. Uh, in Cairo, it was okay, but it wasn't as bad. So yes, in every country where the movie was shown, uh, it, it created a lot of controversy. Yes, yes. But I'm happy. I'm very happy that I did what I did because I always explain to people, look, I am a surgeon. I see a, a sick man. He's here. I open him to see what's the sickness inside of him. And I just look at it as a surgeon. So that's what I, with Lebanon, why this is how I felt. And you were photographing the truth. You were relaying the yeah, truth. Absolutely. It was, uh, there was nothing uh, acting. Uh, there was no acting at all. It was all, I was at every battle, by the way. <clears throat> and just for the little story, um, I was the only one at one point who would go to each bat battle with my cameraman and my assistant. We were seven, by the way, but I, only, I would only take three people with me because it was very, very, so many times we were shot at. I was kidnapped three times. I was kidnapped in the middle of Athens. So uh, uh, it was really dangerous. Uh, but guess what? The reporters, they would sit at Hotel Commodore, drink until they are totally drunk. Uh, and they would come to me and say, George, please, can you give us your footage? So I would sell them my footage to send it to ABC, NBC, CBS, etc. So at the beginning of the war, the first seven, eight months, my footage was the news. Yes. So it served a much bigger purpose. Good for I, you. I suppose so. I yes. George, then you decided to move on and you went to France for a short period of time before settling in LA. Um, how was your experience there? I mean, you did some photography there for Visiora Christian Dior? Yes, for I was the, my friend was the head of the uh, Visiora Christian Dior, which is the makeup. Mm -hmm. professional makeup and she asked me do you want to do photo because I used to do photography as as you know uh, I'm an amateur but I I loved photography and I I sold a lot of my photos by the way so she said why don't you be our photographer I need a, photo a permanent photographer I said okay but if I have if I'm called to do something else I will have to go she said don't worry about it just please uh, do it and I did that for seven years uh, mm -hmm. I was the only photographer for Vizio. For uh, France was an interesting, uh, you, you know, I mean, I, I was raised and educated in France, so it was like home for me, okay? Um, I didn't like living in Paris because it was too crazy. It, uh, it's, uh, even though I love cities, but uh, the ambiance in Paris wasn't, wasn't very, I don't know, it wasn't very safe, uh, healthy. It's not, you know, mentality wasn't healthy. And and so I was lucky enough uh, to meet Jean-Luc Lahaye and I became extremely friendly with Jean-Luc Lahaye, Coluche, uh, the whole bunch, this, this group of uh, people. 
And Jean-Luc said, you know what? I want you to do my next video music, which was Cemila Delila. And I said, yeah, of course. Uh, I mean, what an honor. And, and, and uh, you know, especially nobody knew me. So we, we met at Philips, the company, you know, that was uh, financing. And Philips said, no, uh, we are not taking him. We don't know who the hell is this guy. Where did you bring him from? And uh, I mean, this, I will, God bless him. I mean, he stood up, he said, I'm leaving, it's either him or no video. Wow. And he stuck by me and we did the music video. And this music video was the first one that was screened before movies in Paris, in the theaters. And it was screened in, in, on monitors and uh, monitors in all the metro. Mm -hmm. um, and it was the first video that had a story from oh. A to Z, okay? Um, I'm very, very proud of this movie because it, it, we made it as a movie. And uh, my DP was, uh, God rest his soul, Robbie Brady, who's, who's worked with me for many years. I mean, uh, he did an amazing job. I mean, I am very, very proud. I think if you ask me what is your best, best, best work, I would say that one. Oh, wow. uh, uh, so, uh, so then I went on and did... Uh, several uh, video music and one was when the war broke out again in Lebanon between Syrians and uh, the Christians and uh, so I went and I did another movie called Tell Me Lebanon and I was uh, I spent uh, three weeks with General Owen in those days he was you know uh, in the palace and we spent three weeks in the bunkers but during the day I would go to the front and film the front so yeah, I mean, Good again, you know. experience, well-rounded. Now, George, throughout the years, you ended up working on tens of movies. Can you briefly introduce us to some of your most recent ones? I know you won an Emmy for one of them. Yeah, the one, the Emmy, actually, it was a, uh, it was a group Emmy. Okay, you have to understand, it was a movie uh, produced by ABC. Okay and uh, uh, Hashid story. It's the story of a young kid in Iraq. Uh, he, he was in the car with his parents and the car, you know, went on, on uh, was blown up, okay? And he lost half of his face. So uh, there's a, a foundation uh, that was started by Amal Najjar called the Children of War Foundation. Okay. Uh, she asked me, uh, can, uh, she asked me, do you, can you do a, a documentary about this? We're going to bring this Hashim here, and he's going. We're going to reconstruct his face. Mm -hmm. um, and Dr. Hamoudi, her husband, is one of the leading surgeons here in in LA, actually in America. Um, uh, he. So what we did is we brought him here, yes. and for six months I followed him, and I we did this the, even the surgery from A to Z. And his whole face was reconstructed completely. Mm -hmm. And the kid now is not a kid. He's, he's a young man and he lives happily in, in, uh, in Iraq. He's back in Iraq. So that was, the, that was the documentary that won the Emmy. So the Emmy went, in fact, not to me personally, but because I, am, I was the director and uh, cameraman on it. Of course, you know, I I'm allowed to say, you know, I'm an Emmy Award because the movie won the Emmy. Yes, yes. Congratulations. Anyways, Thanks. George. Now, George, you have a love story with film festivals that started back in 1982. And I mentioned some of them in the introduction. This journey with film festivals culminated with you becoming the executive director, the executive producer of the Hollywood-based Asian World Film Festival. What led to the birth of the Asian World Film Festival. Oh, yeah, yes, 1982. I mean, I used to go to Cannes before, but uh, my love started with the uh, Le Festival du Film Fantastique et de Science Fiction, uh, science fiction and horror movie, which was in Paris, which was like the leading festival in those days um, with Alain Shlokov. So I was a jury delegate and then worked in, with the team on uh, programming and, uh, you know, everything, you know, we were a small team, it was fantastic. And the festival used to take place at Rex, you know, which is a 3000 seat, uh, seat theater. 
And the festival was not only on the screen, it was in the theater itself because people would come dressed. I mean, it was a festive, it was beautiful. Yes. And um, I got to meet great people like Joe Dante. I got to meet uh, many uh, important directors, you know, uh, Lustig, Bill Lustig, Steven Spielberg. Um, in those days, they were unknown, believe it or not. And um, I fell in love with Festival. I said, Jesus, I would like to get uh, involved. So I tried to do a, an Arab film festival. But of course, as uh, we are well known, the Arabs, we never agree. We're all time disagreeing to agree. So uh, I tried many years with uh, Muhammad Rida and we couldn't, we couldn't make it work. So I gave up and then uh, the next festival was, oh, I got involved with Crete, the Women Film Festival, which was one of the first women festival, if not the first women film festival in the world. Then uh, uh, Monaco, I was the executive director of Monaco. But then at this festival, I had total liberty to do whatever I wanted. So I started focusing on countries that very few people heard of, like Yakutia, Buryatia, uh, Tuva, Bashkortostan. So I wanted to focus on countries that are less known at the Monaco Film Festival. Yes. Um, so uh, I, that's how I met the Minister of Culture from Yakutia. I met many people from Yakutia and I fell in love with those guys. They were incredible. And I went to Yakutia at the Yakutsk Film International, which I became one of the, uh, I was the international director. Yes. I fell in love with the country. I fell in love with, incredible, with everything, the, the cinema there. And I said, you know, I, I was so, I was the first one to bring those movies to the West. Nobody ever saw those movies. They were only in Russia because it's part of the Russian Federation. And, um, and then uh, I gave my resignation for personal reasons. And then when I was here, uh, um, the Minister of Culture from Kyrgyzstan, uh, which I became friend through Facebook, believe it or not, made an amazing movie called Kurman Jandatka, which represented Kyrgyzstan. Uh, in 2014, mm -hmm. and it's a beautiful movie. It's an epic, I mean, it's like a David Lean movie, beautifully done, and uh, he was so excited, and I told him, please don't get excited because this is Hollywood. Don't expect anything, you'll be disappointed. Don't, 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 don't. And then when he saw he was not nominated, he was devastated, I mean, literally. And I said, Sadiq, I told you. I told him, he said, yes, I know. But then what happened? Uh, he looked, you know, we were having lunch and he said, how about we do something for the Asian cinema? I said, yeah, what do you want to do? Uh, it didn't come to my mind immediately at festival. So he said, I said, tell me, what do you want to do? And he said, let's do a distribution company. I said, no, it's a mafia. Uh, if we do that, we will be, we won't have, uh, we won't have, we won't have a place in the sun. Forget it. So he said, well, you know festivals, how about the festival? I said, great, let's do a festival. And, but I told him, uh, if we do a festival, we have to do it, uh, you know, it has to be an original festival because there, like, there were like 8,000 festivals in the world, which means 12 movie, 12 festivals a day. You know, I mean, imagine. So I told him we have to do something completely original. And that's how uh, we decided to do a festival only for the Asian cinema, which is, you know, 50 plus countries, which is in fact 53 countries. And um, that's how the Asian World Film Festival uh, started. But then the originality of this festival is we agreed that we will only, no, not only, mostly program movies from, uh, uh, that are submitted to the Oscars. So each country that submits its movie, automatically we take it. You do not have to submit your movie course. So that's what we did. So our program is 80% Oscar and Golden Globe. And we're partnered with the HFPA, by the way, the Golden Globe, they're our mm -hmm. partners. They've been our partners mm -hmm. since day one. They're amazing people. And we're the one of the three festivals in the world that have a scholarship from the HFPA, the Golden Globe, for yes. the short films. Yes. So, um, that's how it was. And the 20, the, the rest, 20%, 
are moving from countries like Yakutia, Buryatia, Nepal, Bhutan, countries that are less known. And, and these programs, actually these movies are extremely, extremely successful. We have full house when we have those movies. Yes, and where is Lebanon in all this? Lebanon is part of Asia. Yeah, but do you get a lot of submissions from Lebanon? Okay, let me tell you something about Lebanon. <laughs> Lebanon, every time I go to Lebanon, I have, I have interview on TV, radio, etc., and I tell them, guys, I'm Lebanese. I'm the executive director of the festival. Please, I am begging you, use me and abuse me. But ego, the ego of the filmmakers in Lebanon is sickening. I fight every year to get movies from Lebanon. Yeah. Every year. But thank God the past two, two, three years now, I have a way in. But I don't need this. They should come to me, George, please. Here's our, here our, here's our movie. Sure. People like, okay, again, like Emil Shaheen and Sam Lahoud, who helped me a lot to get Lebanese movies. But you know, this is crazy. I mean, the most difficult countries I, at the beginning of the festival, the first five, six years, to get where movies from Israel, Lebanon, uh, which country? Yeah, Israel and Lebanon. The mm -hmm. most difficult because mm -hmm. they have this ego. I don't know what it is, what makes them so. They think they're geniuses, but they're not geniuses. They are. We have great filmmakers in Lebanon. But yes. guys, you have an amazing springboard. You have an amazing platform. Use, Use it. it. I'm here for you. Yes. Use it. Yes. Abuse me. Send me your movie. We will do something with your movies. But, yes. but again, thank God, yeah. uh, uh, it's much better now. Yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad, George. Well, George, thank you so much for the wealth of information you just shared with us. Um, you used your camera to spark essential conversations and tapped into world talent and the arts to bridge continents and connect cultures. Yeah, Dr. Anthony. Anthony. Francisco, what, yes. He's writing how impossible it is to make a movie exposing the corruption of Lebanon and how people can repress all their feelings. <laughs> well, you know what? It doesn't matter. They want to fight you. You do it. Yesterday, I did uh, I did a a, a panel at the uh, at the Hollywood film at the Hollywood Arab Film Festival, and there was a young filmmakers from Palestine, and he said, "But it's very difficult. What can I do? I'm uh, Palestinian. Will they? If I write, will they?" Take? I said, "Write it. Right. What doesn't matter if you are criticizing or not? Yeah. Write it. Don't sit and say." Or is it going to be accepted? So I say it here. Yes, if you want to do movies about the corruption, please do it. And I think it should be done. But, you know, I'm still waiting to see that. I'll take one more here uh, from Talat Qattan. He's saying you are a true Lebanese legend. When are you going to make a movie together with no ego in Lebanon so we can show the world what they are missing? <laughs> Talat is a dear friend, and he's from the same region as me. He's from Mina, Almina, and I'm from Tripoli, and he's a friend of mine. Uh, when? Talat, I'm waiting for you. You're the producer. <laughs> I'm here. Anytime you want. Anytime. With you, I'll go anywhere. That's good. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, um, we have one coming your way. Sukaria <coughs> is saying Hollywood is ruled by... Mafia, for sure. Glad you did all this. Well, you know, let me tell you something. In life, if you see the, the if you don't overcome the hurdles, you'll never go anywhere. Yes. So I have a big mouth. I have a lot of enemies <laughs> because I say it how it is. I don't, for example, the all those politically correctness is that Hollywood shot themselves in the foot. I'm sorry. What's politically correctness? Okay, you know, you sit at the discussion. I told them, I told them a few days ago, I said, guys, guess what I'm doing now? I'm preparing a new movie. And in this movie, I'm going to have a midget. I'm going to have a, a non-binary or whatever you call it. I'm going to have LGBTQ, the whole thing. I'm going to have an African-American. Are you happy now? I mean, come on. Hollywood is not about performance anymore. It should be about performance. You make a movie, you take the best of the best. You don't take the people that are, uh, you know, because he is black or he is African-American or he is 
homo, uh, he is uh, gay or whatever. You take him because he is talented. It's talent and performance. Yes. Okay. That's how. Uh, 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 that's how uh, people should make their movies. Yes. You don't. Why do you want to be politically correct? You're politically correct by doing it by choosing the best people for your film. Mm -hmm. Okay. You don't choose a woman because she's a woman and she. Uh, uh, you need a, a woman director. No. You choose her because she is capable. Okay. Message okay. well delivered. Message well delivered. Thank you so much, George. Yeah. There's one last one I'm going to take from Malik. He's saying, Malik Rahbani, thank you, Dr. Lubna and George, for a wonderful talk. Your story is so inspiring. What do you think is going to happen to the cinema with the new technology? Uh, Malik, uh, Malik, okay. First of all, Malik is an amazing talent. He is yes. the future of, for me, I would like him to go to Lebanon and make movies there because he's the future of the Lebanese cinema. Uh, the new technology, you know what? I am not into it. So you have a I comment am... from Michel Jazar. He's saying, remain the clean person. And one from our Consul General to LA, former Consul General, yeah. dear Holy. She's yeah. saying, dear George, so happy to listen to you. Thanks a lot. And thanks to Lubna. Please keep your positive attitude and do a film about Tripoli and show the nice Tripoli you know, not the one they want us all to see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's my dream. This is This is really my dream. If I have one okay. dream, this is it. Okay. It's to make something about Tripoli the way it was in the 50s and 60s. Hopefully in the near future so that we can get to see it because we don't know it. Thank you so much, George, for sharing with us today your unique and inspiring story. You're okay. leaving behind such a great legacy, right? We appreciate it. Is there anything else you'd like to add before I wrap it up? No, I'm I'm happy to see some people I haven't seen in a long time. <laughs> Jean, uh, Andy Chang and... Uh, all those people I haven't seen in so long, you know. Yes. Uh, but it's good. And now Yuki, these are my team. They're here. Yes. And yes. thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Lisa. I mean, that's amazing. Lisa is 95 years old, guys. And she's still working, making movies. Thank you. Thank you, George. I appreciate all thank of you, you, the audience, for joining us today. Please don't forget to join us again next time. Today's event will be uploaded to my YouTube channel where you can watch it and share it freely. Yeah. Thank you all for bringing us into your home and making us part of your Saturday. Goodbye. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you, so Thank much you George. For this opportunity. Thank you.